This is such a magical, and mysterious, fantastical creation that we have been set in. If we only knew, you know, if we, if we could only open all of our capacities to participate in ways that are not harmful to anybody or anything. What an amazing gift of life. Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute in which we interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, asking them all our one impertinent question, with all that seems to be going awry, what could possibly go right? Our guest today is Pat McCabe, also known as Woman Stands Shining. She is a Diné Navajo mother, grandmother, activist, artist, writer, ceremonial leader, and international speaker. She is a voice for global peace, and her paintings are created as tools for individuals, earth, and global healing. She draws on the indigenous sciences of thriving life to reframe questions about sustainability and balance, and she is devoted to supporting the next generations, women's nation, and men's nation in being functional members of the hoop of life and upholding the honor of being human. Her primary work at this moment is the reconciliation between the masculine and feminine, men's nation and women's nation, remembering, recreating, or creating anew a narrative for the sacred masculine, and addressing the archetypal wounding that occurred in our understanding and abuse of technology in prayer, ceremony, and science. I enjoyed this conversation immensely, and I believe you will too. There's a presence about Pat. There's something about what she says that had me settle into a deeper place in myself than I ordinary, ordinarily operate in. And so I allowed it to go a bit longer, and I think you'll see why. Welcome, Pat McCabe, and thank you so much for joining me on What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute. And you are extremely generous with your time. I believe because you carry important messages from your nation for Western nations in this time of conflict, climate, heating, and coming apart everywhere. So I've in, our, in the past interviews, I've posed our one question, what could possibly go right, to wise and far-seeing people from around the world. And after 60 such conversations, even with important clues, I now see the solutionary mind behind my question, a mind that seeks with great dedication and love answers. I have one of those minds and I've done all in my power for 40 years to find the keys to our demise and open channels for change. Sincere as this inquiry has been, I now see it in a, as a binary frame as if there is a wrong we can name and a right we can enact. Um, and, um, yeah, but I now see that that's sort of reinforcing uh, a mental approach to what seems to be a worldview embedded in all of us and that we all create from. And if we seek other voices as, as if they have solutions, we're still holding firm to problems have solutions mindset. And some problems do have solutions, material problems like a leaking roof or a sputtering car. But we are constrained now, I believe, by a mindset or belief system or worldview illness embedded in all of our governance and economic structures. And I think you travel and speak to offer humbly and without judgment that I can tell a window into another way of seeing and being. You aren't glorifying and reifying indigenous ways. Uh, you speak from what you've been taught and what has been a North Star for your nation and indigenous peoples around the world. So, with all of that, with that opening, which may or may not spark something in you, I will turn this over to you with this question, but I'm paraphrasing it. With all that seems to be going awry, what are we not seeing that could guide us to a better way for humans to inhabit this earth? Over to you, Pat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vicki, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, this is um, something that came up in, a, I was on a panel something that you're saying came up on a panel and um, 
I was the only indigenous person on the panel and this was relative to um, COP26. And uh, I just had to name, I said, you know, this might sound shocking, but it really shouldn't if you think about it at all. <laughs> um, uh, I've been rooting for the collapse of modern world paradigm for a long time. <laughs> So I would just have us, as you as you say here, note that you know, for indigenous peoples in general, um, that the modern world paradigm is what came to believe that it had the right to overcome all other paradigms and attempted to do so and still attempts to do so by force. Um, sometimes it looks more like economic force or other kinds of force, but um, but that was that was uh, the experience of indigenous peoples all over this earth. And so I think it is important to take a moment to look at it from that perspective and say, why, um, why wouldn't I be um, rooting for the collapse <laughs> of, of that mentality and that, dis that destructive force, not only on peoples, but on, on places, on waters, et cetera. So, um, you know, I have, there's some young people that I've spoke with who go so far as to say that the apocalypse is a colonial construct. So we'll just put that out there to, to, to stew in a little bit, to marinate in just a little bit here at the very start of this conversation. Now, that's not to say that um, I'm, I've, that I don't understand that there is an enormous amount of suffering that has already gone on as as the collapse has begun or you know for some people it's been going on for quite a long time um the the holy people my my spirit helpers have told me that by the time you know this this change this transformation or this collapse um hits first world nations we're going to be very 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 far into it. And so um, I don't think it's quite registered with First Nations yet. I don't mean First Nations Indigenous. I mean, First World, I guess is the word I'm looking for. First World um, uh, societies. Um, but that is only because I think it's being kind of well hidden. There's still a, a great shell game going on. In, in the financial markets and even with food with, I mean, we're starting to, to watch what's happening with, you know, it's, it's starting to register that we might not get our Christmas presents <laughs> delivered, you know, <laughs> on one level. Um, and then there's those who are giving, you know, heart and soul at COP26 and, um, and they're definitely getting it, right? Those who are protesting outside and those who are holding conversation, the, the actual conversations that need to be need to be had around um, our humanity's relationship to, to planet, to mother earth. Um, so I guess some of what you said provoked, provoked that in me to say out loud here. Um, <clears throat> but what, what are we maybe missing here? You know, from, from my culture's perspective, well, I, I didn't, I didn't start out with my own introduction about my culture, so I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit there. I was born into, by blood, I'm Dene, born into Dene Nation, and so I'll say, She'e iya, tachi i nishli, aro ash i bashish chi, ma i dishkej ne dash nale, taush ti daush che, agwa taush dan i nishli. And so I'm telling you about my mother's clans. And then I was also adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life, and in that way I was given the name Wiakpa Najinwi. And that translates maybe roughly in English to women's women stand shining, or as I've been saying lately, womaning standing shining, uh, because I see myself now as this um, catalyst, as this energetic, as the female of our kind, and um, and I have um, a sacred influence. I can have a sacred influence on all that I encounter. Um, and so I, I really want to acknowledge that um, for us in general, but also for myself as, as to be led in that way and to, to really bring to bear the, that medicine for, 
for all of us. In both, well, I'll stick with Diné cosmology. Um, my clan grandfather spoke many times about how we have already traveled through worlds that, and you may hear different indigenous peoples talk about maybe this is the fifth world or the sixth world. And so that's not something that's really held in, in modern world paradigm or Western science paradigm um, exactly or not, not in the same way for sure. Um, and, and so that means we have already lost worlds. We have already had to begin again. Um, and we have stories about how humanity came to um, survive some of these, the, the losing of worlds. Um, and so we have our allies in our stories about who helped us be able to begin again, right? And so from that perspective, um, I'll also say that, you know, my clan grandfather told me that, um, that we even know the reason for at least one of the worlds that we lost, um, the world we lost in the flood. He says that we lost that world because men and women believed they could live without each other. So, so there even seems to be almost like a, a little bit of a, mor a moral um, cause and effect that is named at least by some of my elders about, about why we're losing these worlds. And, um, um, and so here we are at the brink of a possible another loss. And, and, I, and I want to reiterate in this disposable society that I don't intend to, to say that, you know, these worlds are, ah, lost a world, you know, no big deal. <laughs> it's a pretty big deal. It's a very big deal. And so, but, but it helps me to have that context and that framework as I look at our situation. Um, and so what I see is that, you know, I often use this symbol here. This is, some people know it as the medicine wheel. I often refer to it as the sacred hoop of life. And this, um, this medicine wheel uh, can describe, you know, that every single living being on this mother earth gets to have a seat on this sacred hoop. And every single member has some kind of perfect design to uphold their part of that sacred hoop. And somehow we, the five fingered ones get to have a seat on that sacred hoop amongst all of our relations, which is to me an incredible, incredible, miraculous um, gift. And, and place of honor to, to have a seat on that sacred hoop of life. And so I'm going to say that somehow we must also have a perfect design for thriving life. And the question is, do we, do we know what it is? So this has been you know, a big part of my um, scientific inquiry is, is, is am I, what do I know? How, how can I know? And what do I know about my perfect design for thriving life as human being here? And what specifically um, is my part as the female of our kind to uphold hum humanity's uh, part of the sacred hoop? So that's been a deep exploration for me for, for quite a while now. You know, what this, what this implies is how interrelated, how interconnected we are. Thich Nhat Hanh says that we are interbeing. And I love that word that he gave us. So we are interbeing here. And what that is saying is that uh, I think this is the lesson of, 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 these, of these worlds is that we get to have, we get to do whatever we wanna do here. I mean, look around, look at, look at what's happening on this, on this mother earth right now, especially in, well, pretty much only in regards to humanity. We are doing anything that we can dream up to do, we just do it now. We've been, we've been sort of getting away with that, um, not, not exactly because the consequences have been building and now they're, now they're snowball um, and avalanche size, but, um, but we, have been, we have been feeling that that was our, our place to do that. And, um, and, we have, and we've been given, we've been allowed to do that, but we're running up against uh, uh, a natural boundary, if you will. And that is we might get to do whatever we can dream up to do, but we might not then get to live on this earth. <laughs> so, so that's a heck of a boundary, right? Um, but what I also wanna say is uh, 
every single thing that we do in such a system as this, even our water system. You know, science calls it a closed water system. You know, it's always circulating. It's always been the same water, right? And this also speaks to how interrelated we are. Everything that we put in that water is going to come around back to us. We can't send it away somewhere. And, we, and not only that, we have to be able to use this water again to live and for every living thing to live. And so this interbeing is saying that every single action we take affects every other being. Every action we take affects every other being sooner or later. So it's, it's a heck of a setup, if you think about it, to, to be here on this Mother Earth and to be given absolute free will and then having to notice, and this is kind of a juvenile in my, in, from where I sit, it's, it's a juvenile thing to have to be taught and to notice that your actions affect others. But this does seem to be like the spiritual um, arena almost for us to, to grapple with and to reckon with at this time. So we're really being asked over and over all these questions I feel like around climate, around science, around government, around economics, around everything is, is asking, can we fully allow in the truth that everything we do affects every other? And can we fully allow in the truth that if anybody's suffering, we're going to suffer? Can we really allow in the truth that I can't be well if you're not well? And when I look at indigenous perspective and teachings from the elders, that is what is embedded deeply in so much of our spiritual practice and um, societal structure and relationship with earth and water is, is this, th these have been the bumpers <laughs> that have been guiding where we as human beings can travel and live in a good way and, and cause everything to live in a good way. So again, you know, I've been saying, it's not that we weren't smart enough to build a nuclear weapon, we are. <laughs> and it's not that we didn't have the smarts to do all these things that are going on. You know, that's why people have mistakenly looked at us and said, oh, these primitive people, but that's not it. It's that these, it's that indigenous peoples or certain factions of humanity have been guided by this principle that whatever I do um, affects everything. And that's a responsibility that I want to take seriously. And um, in, in the situation that we find ourselves in now, that might feel daunting or restrictive. But when I look at the way my, my ancestors lived and, and, and how those traditions are still carried forward um, to, to harmonize, like to really use all of your ingenuity and all of your intelligence and all of your curiosity and creativity and all of these things that are so inherent to human beings. My clan grandfather used to say, here we are, holy earth surface walkers dazzled by creation, coming upon temptation. So, you know, I mean, he was talking pre-colonization, right? <laughs> Human beings have had this, had this temptation and this curiosity thing going, right? That's inherent in us. But to use all of the, those faculties to harmonize and, and to, and, you know, where, where all of that human in, uh, impulse, I guess I'll say, and maybe instinct too, gets channeled, becomes into beauty, into celebration, into praise, into spiritual life, into um, just really deep and beautiful ways to love and, um, and, and uh, acknowledge each other, um, animals, plants, everything around. So, um, so it really led us into, as human beings on this earth, into some really extraordinarily beautiful places. And this is what I feel like um, modern society, modern world paradigm doesn't have much experience with. And it's, it's devastating. I think it's devastating. And as I watch young people, I really, I really feel for them. And I always want to say to them, and I want to say to everybody, this is such a magical and mysterious 
fantastical creation that we have been set in. If we, if we only knew, you know, if we, if we could only open all of our capacities to participate in ways that are not harmful to anybody or anything. Um, what an amazing, what an amazing gift of life we could have and, and some of us have known and are, and are attempting to carry forward even in the face of a paradigm that sees things from a very, very different way. Mm -hmm. uh, so much in what you just said, and I really thank you um, for the evocation. It's, it's, there, there are words and there's symbols, but there's something behind all of this that, that I can feel. You know, and I, one of the things that I've learned through doing what could possibly go right is uh, my little quip is if uh, you can't heal the world, if you can't feel the world. And I think what you're saying is that, that we with a modern worldview are not yet feeling the consequences of our actions. And so we're not responding in an appropriate way. So that's a piece of what I'm hearing. Another piece of what I'm hearing is, is basic, the, it's that basic truth of the golden rule. You know, it's, in, in other language, you know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you and others is everything, you know, the trees and the grass, et cetera. And I'm also hearing from what you're saying that, you know, this, this question of, you know, who are we as humans? You know, what is our role? If, if, we've, if everywhere we step, we're, we seem to be squashing something, you know, if we feel like this, these giants in the land that just don't even understand what's under our feet, I hear you saying that now I'm just I'm saying this to, to check myself that his creator in some way has given us this free will to find our rightful place, you know, that there's this creativity, this praise, this awe and wonder, this this is even this like saying back to all of life, how beautiful you are, how beautiful you are. That feels like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of listening for, okay, fine. What's the solution? What did creator tell us to do, you know? But it feels like that's, that's um, something of what you're indicating. It's, a, it's an attitude of praise and wonder and respect. And we can still have, you know, all the fun we have as creative humans with that attitude. And that's not punitive. That's not saying, oh, naughty Western mind. <laughs> it's sort of more saying there's an opportunity here that you are totally missing. You know, and you, you, some people have said, you know, Western civilization is a bunch of toddlers. You know, we're just trying, we don't even know our power. We're just sort of like flailing around trying to prove ourselves. But that, that I feel like you're saying there is something on the other side of this collapse and even through it that's that has the seeds of finding our rightful place on that hoop in other words it's sort of like you know you have to be taken by the ear you know? <laughs> and told to sit down you know and listen and listen just i don't think we're going to get anywhere by solving this i think it's listening it's like you know we got to listen maybe for several generations <laughs> You know, so I, these are, are um, some of the things I'm taking away. I, I call this what we are living in is the era of consequences. You know, we're just, you were just reaping the whirlwind. You know, this is, so I, I've, I've said in, in, in my own work, you know, we are free to do, have, do, and be anything we want, but we are not free of consequences. And I think that's a bit what you're saying. And there's another term, you know, Armageddon, there's another term that, that's used like in Christianity, which is the apocalypse, which actually is sort of like the, the falling away of illusion, you know, the seeing behind the screen. It's the great revealing. That's what it is. It's the revealing. And so we, we're enduring revealing the consequences of our mindset. So, I mean, can you, can you offer some words about, like, as you say, there's so much suffering that's, that's with us now and coming. And how do we live through this time? How do people of goodwill, maybe still toddlers crashing about, 
How do we live through this time? Well, I, um, I, I have this saying that, you know, that through this time, what I want to keep my eye on is I want to uphold the honor of being human being to the very best of my ability. Mm-hmm. So I continue my study into what, it, what, who, who, you know, I have this, I guess, paradigm for me is about who we are, where we are, how it is. And, um, and so if I, if I want to continue to walk forward with a sense of truly the deep honor and gift that this life is, that has been given to me and to us. And so I want to keep um, expressing, expressing gratitude that way. And I want to keep expressing um, honor and respect for all of the other living beings around me. Um, and, and I guess I will say that I feel, um, you know, like people always want to know, like, what do we do? Let's have point A, B, C, D, E. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm asking what would I even say to that if, if really pressed there, but, but I just feel like for us to begin to reorient to understand the story that we have that we have accepted and been embedded in and to realize that it's a story and that you know my spirit helpers tell me always you know you guys can have it any way you want it do you know that you're in a free will construct you can have it any way you want it and right now you're saying you want it like this you know and there's this really uh succinct meme I guess out and it says something like that you guys can have it any way you want it and right now you're saying you want white supremacy and credit scores like that's what you want to reduce this whole planet down to (laughs) white supremacy and credit scores it's like out of all the options this is it um (laughs) and we call ourselves like the pinnacle of the evolution um yeah uh no so so I guess what I feel to do, rather than try to name the specifics, um, which some people get frustrated with me about, and other indigenous people get frustrated with me about, um, but I want to say, you know, first let's let's realize that the paradigm, the modern world paradigm, is a choice, and let's notice that all of the way it has been, it's found from its foundation to all of its evolution in the last five thousand years all the human systems of governance, economics, um, health, education, you know, the biggies that way, um, they were all created without thinking about putting life at the center. Mm -hmm. And they were all created without, as though we could not understand this concept here, this interbeing that was nowhere in their construct. They were created um, with the idea that everything is for human beings. And as it turns out, <laughs> we, we actually need some other beings in order to even be ourselves. So, um, so, so part of the, the task then for me, it seems, is to begin to notice how my identity is tied into those systems. And, you know, so I, this is where I feel like I have this enormous privilege. It has sometimes been very, very painful and didn't feel like a privilege at all, but to, but to actually operate out of two different paradigms, two different understandings of how to be human on earth is actually a huge privilege because if I had only been born into modern world paradigm, and if I had only witnessed that and only been presented with that multi-generationally, why would I think there's anything else? I would just be like, well, Wall Street, that's how Earth is. This is just how she is, you know? And, uh, <laughs> or pharmaceuticals, that's just how she is. You know, how could I, how could I even know? So this is what I feel like my, my role is a lot of the time is to try to say, well, there, here's these other humans and here's how they think about it. And they're in the exact same circumstance, exact same sky, exact same water, exact same mothers fathers children aunts uncle you know um the dilemma of eating food the dilemma of aging the all you know and and they're choosing to go about this in a really different way 
what can we notice about that? What does that say to you about what is possible? Um, I do feel that um, at this time, um, well, you know, one of the things that happened at a gathering, I was at the New Story Summit, in which we got like, all these people had been gathered from all parts of the earth. This was in 2014 at Findhorn in Scotland. And all of these different peoples had been gathered. And we thought, well, if we get this really amazing cross-section of humanity, perhaps we can tell, um, begin to create a new story because we're always operating out of a story. We're, we're story-based beings as human beings. We're, so narratives are very important, which of course media is very aware of. <laughs> Advertising is very aware of. Um, we're, we, we're totally geared towards stories. So, so the idea was, well, maybe we should, you know, the story we're in now is leading to death. So perhaps we can come up with a new story or at least the beginnings of the elements of what is the new story that we would want to be in. And it was complete chaos and, and totally wild and, and absolutely necessary and amazing. Um, but there was one moment where things had broken into, broken down into chaos again. <laughs> and so I went outside and I was sitting in the dunes and, um, and my spirit helpers came to me and they said, um, rather than try to tell a new story from this point forward, you would be better off retelling the old story. And if you go back and retell the old story, you will automatically change your trajectory into the future. Mm. So rather than try to tell a new story from this point forward, you'd be better off retelling the old story. And if you go back and retell the old story, you will automatically change the trajectory into the future. Well, so that, that sat in my bones, right? That, that rang true in my body, but I thought, what in the world am I going to do with that? <laughs> So, but I will say that I've been kind of living out of that council since 2014, not that long, but I really gear much of my, my work, my efforts of, of being human being towards that. And, um, and so I'm learning, what does it mean to retell the old story? Well, there are stories that are being retold to us right now. In, in many different ways. Um, so one thing that I noticed that's arising is, is what I'm calling co-witnessing. And co-witnessing is, for instance, you know, here in, in the United States, um, when George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight on the street by a police officer, um, you know, it was it that black people didn't understand that this had been going on or that this was possible to, to happen? No, they understood. They, they were very clear <laughs> that this was a, a, a danger to their lives such that they would have to have talks with their children about what to expect when they left the house and how to try to preserve themselves in such a situation. So they were very clear on it. But what was really amazing was all of a sudden there's this outcry from all over, from all factions about, oh, my God, how could this happen? How could this happen that this black man, that a police officer could kneel on this black man's neck and press the life out of him for 10 minutes on camera in broad daylight? So there was all of a sudden this like... Um, well, I just call it co-witnessing because it's like a denial dropped somehow mm -hmm. and, and people's eyes are on it. People's hearts are in it. They hear the story and they're wondering, you know, and so all of a sudden that narrative that, that has only been held by one part of the population is being held across many parts of the population. That's an interesting phenomenon to me. I, I don't know why it didn't happen before. I don't know why it's happening now, but it is. And I will say the same for the residential boarding schools um, for indigenous children. You know, uh, it, it was law that, that, that indigenous children would be taken away from their parents and sent to these residential boarding schools. And the purpose of those residential boarding schools was, you know, absolutely, I mean, it was written on the walls. It wasn't some kind of secret that, you know, we want to make their own cultures so repulsive to them that they will never return to them. So this was like, the deepest assimilation project, right? And, um, and so all these little kids were taken away from their families um, by law and brought into these residential boarding schools. And so now all of a sudden we're finding these mass graves of these small children at the, on the grounds of the Catholic residential boarding schools in Canada. And there's a call for an investigation to go on here in the United States. That's one thing we could do. Press your, press your, 
polit political people to say, yes, we do want to see that happen. That's something I would call for, because I think that we're ready for that kind of co-witnessing in this nation um, about really what this nation, what it took to build this nation, to superimpose this nation upon a humanity that had civilizations that had risen and fallen for millennia here on this continent. Um, so, so what am I saying? So I'm saying that, that you know, there's something about this co-witnessing that is retelling the stories for us and, and giving us some more information, giving us impetus to take bigger risks, I'm gonna say, bigger risks in relationship, bigger risks of generosity. Um, that's what I think is happening with this co-witnessing. So that's just one aspect of retelling the old story. There are so many that I'm learning about and, and that my work has been based on, even, even just to talk about modern world paradigm is a retelling of the story because that's been the only game in town, <laughs> right? But now there's this cracking open of people wanting to ha understand, like, how can I begin to grapple with, with what's happening? And, and so I feel like um, retelling the old story by saying, this is just one way of being human. Whereas that has not been able, that has not been welcomed, you know? My ancestors could have said that a long time ago. My great grandparents, they wouldn't have been heard, nor would my grandparents, nor were my parents. So it's my generation where I get to sit on your show here. And honestly, I'm on, I'm podcasting, summiting, webinaring like crazy right now. It's, it's kind of a miracle that, that my generation's voice is the one that is ready to be heard. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. That I, I think I, I, it's so beautiful. And it seems like that relates back to the the idea of the apocalypse, the co-witnessing, or even personal work about shadow work. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't go like to a weekend workshop and go like, I'm going to go to a shadow workshop and I'm just going to get all that sucker out. And you know, <laughs> it's, it's, that is, that is what has been hidden that needs to be revealed for us, for our wholeness. And in a way, we're so spiritually weakened by not knowing these stories, the old stories, not having access to another story or other stories. Uh, and um, so I'm just, I'm profoundly grateful. I have, do have one other question. I, mean, I know we only have a couple of minutes. Is I, I heard you say today, and I've heard you say other times, um, that it's about an imbalance between the male men and women, that the separation of men and women is, is one of the worlds, that's what happened. And I've heard you say that you went to indigenous people, I believe in South America, and there was a call that went out and only women appeared and they, they thought deeply and they said, this is significant. Um, and so could you just say a little bit about the, the, the healing, whether it's between men and women, masculine and feminine, patterns of relationship, you know, is there something that you could share about that? Well, I think the quickest way to say what I like to say the most about it is to say that in ceremony, I was told this thing that has changed everything. And that was that um, the spirit guide said to me, you think you know what masculine is, but you don't. And you think you know what feminine is, but you don't. All you know is how those two energetics behave when you plug them into a power over paradigm. But if you plug them into a different paradigm, they behave in a completely different way. So for me, now there's a retelling of the old story. <laughs> quite succinctly because it's the spirits talking. They have a great way with talk. It was saying what needs to be said in a short space. But um, so, so what I feel like that does is one, uh, you know, I, I've been saying this thing lately and I just feel like one of the greatest untapped human resources 
I mean, I don't even know. I, I'm trying to work on my language. That's such an extractive uh, exactly. language, but, <laughs> but, but let's just say for the moment, one of the greatest untapped human resources that we have yet to see come, come to our aid is the sacred masculine. And that is, I believe, because, you know, so, so one, um, you know, in the power over paradigm, I say might makes right. It's, it's, you have to overcome another in order to have what you need. So it's highly, highly competitive. It's not conducive to cooperation, collaboration, and men will dominate in such a system where, where brute force is really the currency there. We make it polite in different ways, but ultimately it's brute force. And so therefore it is inherently violent, I will say. And so, um, and so as long as that was the only playing field that humanity thought they had to, to enact being human in, you know, the men have been going for it. They've been doing what they can to, at least, you know, somebody's got to win in this. Somebody, in order to be able to live, you know, somebody's got to win at that game. And so, so we equate that paradigm with men. But I myself say men are not the patriarchy. The paradigm is the patriarchy. And, and so we don't even know who men are. Because we, many of us, including myself, have been pointing our fingers at the men and saying, patriarch, patriarch, you're the patriarch, you're the problem, you're the one. And, um, and it sure does look that way in many instances. But I'm going to say that if we can have the willingness to separate the men from the paradigm, then we have this new, we have element X here, or maybe it's element Y, I forget. <laughs> I think it's element <laughs> Y. But anyway, um, and we don't know what they're capable of. We don't know what happens when they step into their perfect design for thriving life as holy earth surface walker. And so I'm very excited at this prospect, but I can tell you one thing that will happen is when they step into that place, there is going to be a level of safety that we have not known for some time because they're stepping out of the violent paradigm, which means we're gonna to have to create something that has an opportunity to not be violent that way. Mm. Um, when you put that sexuality and masculine eros in a power over paradigm, woof, well, you get what we have. It's, it's, it's frightening, right? And so uh, men themselves are afraid of their own eros. And yet I have to say, you know, because it's such a prominent part of their, of their, of their way um, uh, in general, that's kind of a generalization, I guess. I have to believe it's part of the, their perfect design for thriving life contribution, and therefore it should be honored and respected by all of us. How do we get to that point? I don't know. But once that happens, I feel like this safety factor is one going to open up the feminine eros in a way that we have not seen for thousands of years, when she can really be free to do what she knows how to do, <laughs> what she was made to do. Um, and many cultures have have really um, benefited from the medicine of of her sexual and sensuous um, travels, basically, to travel to other dimensions, to travel to even off planet, to bless, bless huge, 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 bless the whole planet at once, um, but also to receive insight and information. It's kind of it can be a kind of a vision quest in in sexuality for a woman. But that has not been able to be present. And so I also ask, and maybe we can end here, is what, how will the earth respond to such safety from our kind of the masculine stepping fully into sacred masculine? We don't even know how she would respond. Right now, I would imagine she, has, she also has to have something of a defensive posture. So all possibilities still humming in the air as far as I'm concerned. What could possibly go right? <laughs> All possibilities humming in the air. The liberation of our minds and hearts and lives from a paradigm that, that produces what we've seen in this world, the destruction we've seen. I love the potency and the non-answer, <laughs> the non-solution of this. And thank you so much, Pat McKay. Thank, thank you so much. much. I feel very privileged to have received the teachings that you've offered today. Thank you very much. My honor. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people. 
Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks also to Asher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.